Now I would like to introduce uh, our next uh, speaker, who is Sydney Colusi. Uh, Sydney is a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney, a co-convener of Body at Work project, and member of the Women Work and Policy Research Group. Her research explores the role of trade unions in advocating for legal and workplace prote uh, protections for a range of reproductive health issues, including menstruation, pregnancy loss, fertility treatment, and menopause. Sydney is a regular commentator on, the, uh, on this topic and has co-authored academic and uh, media articles on the relation between reproductive health, uh, paid work, and gender equality. The topic of her presentation is, uh, for today is navigating reproductive policy, examining global and Australian trends, uh, union involvement, and gender equality implication. Now I would like to invite Sydney. Uh, thank you so much, Mahan, for that kind welcome. Uh, I kind of feel like I'm about to give you the evening news. Uh, <laughs> um, so thank you everyone so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Sydney Kalusi. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney, where I'm looking into the role of trade unions and advocating for different reproductive support policies. Uh, as Liz Hill mentioned, I'm one of the co-conveners of the Body at Work project. Uh, we started looking into menstrual leave a few years ago, but have since uh, broadened our ambit to consider other issues like pregnancy loss, fertility treatment, uh, IVF, menopause. Uh, so yeah, today I'll be talking you through specifically the role of trade unions in engaging with this space and uh, specifically the potential implications from a gender and work perspective. Uh, but before I go any further, I would like to uh, acknowledge that I live and work on Gadigal land, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be talking about the role of trade unions specifically in advocating for reproductive policies. Uh, in our work, we've defined reproductive policies quite broadly to include uh, paid and unpaid leave, flexible work, and really any other workplace support or initiative to address the reproductive body. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background and context, building on what Liz has already told us about this emerging but really rapidly evolving policy area. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of a brief overview of union policy innovation within Australia and globally. Uh, as you can imagine, there's so much happening in the space, but I really can't do it justice in 15 minutes, but I'll do my best. Uh, I'll give you a bit of um, an overview of what we think are the key themes and justifications for this type of policy area, as well as the potential policy pathways for reform going forward. Uh, and yeah, I'll just conclude by discussing what we think are the implications for trade unions, uh, workplaces generally, and uh, importantly for women and gender equality at work. Uh, okay, so building on what Liz has already taken us through, um, we know that reproductive policies are generating a lot of traction, especially in the last 18 months. I mean, in 2017, when menstrual leave kind of took off in the media, I think it was considered a much more uh, controversial and out there claim than what it's considered now. Uh, we've seen a lot of engagement among governments and employers uh, with this policy space, uh, particularly in terms of legislating for change. Uh, so I've just got some examples here. In 2020, Malta legislated up to 100 hours of IVF leave uh, for its citizens. Uh, you know, that this is becoming increasingly important in a context of declining fertility and aging populations. Uh, Spain, as I'm sure you're aware, became the first European country to formally legislate menstrual leave at the start of this year. Uh, and Ireland is also currently considering uh, a new reproductive leave bill to introduce leave to women for pregnancy loss uh, and IVF. So this is all to say that governments uh, and employers alike are taking this issue quite seriously. Of course, we've just heard from Mary Crooks from the Victorian Women's Trust, uh, which was one of the first organisations, as far as I'm aware, to uh, spearhead uh, a new type of approach to women in the reproductive body at work by off uh, offering a really comprehensive menstruation policy. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in this space among different actors, but my research specifically focuses on the role of trade unions uh, in giving voice to the interests at work in relation to this topic. Uh, so 
In my opinion, in our research today at the Body at Work project, we've found that unions are really becoming pace setters in this policy area um, and are leading the charge for change, whether that be at an organizational or legislative level. Uh, this is especially the case in what you might call the Anglosphere, so English speaking countries like Australia, Ireland, uh, and the UK, which is sort of the um, jurisdictional focus of my research. Uh, okay, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a snapshot of what's been happening in Australia over the past few years. Um, I think the most important place to start is that Australia is really emerging as a global leader in this policy area. Uh, and something else a bit interesting to note is that the idea of reproductive and menstrual leave isn't entirely new in the Australian context. Uh, we found that some early cases for menstrual leave claims were actually in the early 2000s, uh, one of which was lodged by the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union uh, with Toyota back in, I believe, 2003. As you can imagine, that was a pretty controversial claim at the time, but interesting to know that there was already a bit of groundwork um, in Australia. Uh, but more recently, I've just, I'm have just i gonna highlight a couple of the key case studies here, but in 2020, the Health and Community Services Union in Victoria uh, entered a really groundbreaking claim for reproductive health and wellbeing leave in their negotiations with um, employers. And it's groundbreaking in the sense that it was extremely comprehensive in its approach. It didn't just cover menstruation and menopause, it covered a really wide range of reproductive health concerns, everything from uh, IVF to endometriosis to PCOS, vasectomies, hy hysterectomies, pregnancy loss, terminations. I mean, they really tried to think of every possible thing that someone might be experiencing with their reproductive body that could potentially inhibit their capacity to work. Uh, we followed this claim over the past few years and it was really uh, drawn back during bargaining, but I think just the effort to try to codify such a broad range of reproductive health issues into an EA was sort of a significant step. And I think we're starting to see that become more normalized now. Uh, so, you know, building on the bargaining space, the NTU has also entered claims for menstruation and menopause leave in its recent bargaining rounds. Uh, with the University of Sydney and Charles Darwin University. Uh, again, to varying degrees of success, uh, as you can imagine, there is employer pushback regarding concerns about take up and cost. But as Mary has told us, these concerns can be inflated given that from what we're hearing from organizations, the take up it can be quite low. Uh, and then another interesting case study is the finance sector union, which has been recently bargaining with some of Australia's biggest banks to include initiatives for menstruation and menopause leave, uh, also family planning leave. So again, IVF uh, and accommodating pregnancy loss as well. Uh, so this is just to say that there's a lot happening in the Australian space. I know that I've missed a number of case studies here and I anticipate there's going to be a lot more activity um, in the months and years to come, but you know, I think something else that marks the Australian case is quite interesting is this emergence of trade union coalitions and industry partnerships emerging and uh, kind of unifying around this issue. Um, I won't speak to this too much because Jess Heron from Morris Blackburn is in the room and I know we'll speak to this later, but um, a really interesting development in this space was the announcement of Morris Blackburn's campaign with Australian trade unions to campaign for menstruation and menopause leave. Uh, Jess will take you through this, I'm sure, but the crux of the argument is that the Fair Work Act and the National Employment Standards are basically inadequate in their current drafting to support uh, people who are experiencing difficulties associated with menstruation and menopause symptoms. Uh, like Liz said, and like Mary said, it's controversial to argue that people should have to take sick or personal leave uh, for these issues, especially when we know that women are more likely to conserve their personal leave for say childcare obligations, and then they have no leave left for their own reproductive health concerns. So, you know, that's a major ongoing uh, uh, campaign. Uh, and then looking more broadly at the global policy space, um, like I said before, I've basically got um, all Anglo countries here as my case studies. This just happens to be where the activity is taking place. Um, I'm not, this is the focus of my research. I'm not quite sure why there are such strong parallels between uh, Ireland and the UK and Australia, but there are very similar approaches. 
Um, so for example, the Irish National Teachers Organization played a really central role in advocating for that new reproductive leave bill in Ireland that I mentioned. Uh, and the reason that they sort of tried to engage so strongly with policy reform in, at the public policy level was because they surveyed their members and found that a significant number felt that they weren't supported in workplace policy when they were experiencing uh, prolonged fertility treatment rounds or if they had experienced miscarriage and pregnancy loss. Uh, so, you know, kind of like the Morris Blackburn campaign, there's, um, you know, an attempt not just to codify these issues into enterprise agreements, but also into legislation as well. Um, also in Ireland, FORSA, one of the largest civil and public sector unions, um, launched a major campaign for menstruation and menopause leave that they've called the hashtag Stop the Stigma campaign. Uh, this is a, based on a trade union coalition of a bunch of Irish unions, including the Irish Trade Unions Congress, uh, the Financial Su Services Union, the Midwives Union. Uh, and again, the idea here is to not only provide uh, incentivize employers to address these issues in policy, but also to educate uh, and destigmatize these issues in paid work. Uh, and then the other three unions I have listed here, the Finance Services Union, Unison, and the Wales Trade Union Congress, uh, they have all been engaging with menopause policy development in different ways. So uh, the Financial Services Union is uh, currently negotiating with employers over this topic. Uh, Unison developed a model menopause policy for its union branches a couple of years ago. Uh, and the Wales Trade Union Congress has taken its own unique approach by developing what they call a toolkit for uh, union advocates and negotiators to address health and equality concerns related to menopause. So, um, you know, there's not sort of one size fits all approach to how unions are going about this. There's different strategic um, pathways depending on what a union sees as, you know, the best opportunity for change. But, you know, it's kind of hard to capture the the really rapid interest and development, and even behind the scenes and conversations here, I hear so much about, you know, different union activities in this space. But um, in terms of the themes and uh, policy implications of this space, uh, as Liz has already taken us through, um, in our research, we've tried to be quite careful to sort of understand the drivers of these policies, you know, what's the rationale, what's the justification, um, what's unifying these different types of initiatives. And of course, as Mary has addressed and as Liz has addressed, uh, whenever an employer or union has engaged with this topic, it is almost always framed as a means of normalizing and destigmatizing this issue at work to address the taboo nature of the reproductive body, you know, challenge male oriented notions of work that, um, you know, historically have not accommodated the body. Uh, but then there are also really practical workforce sustainability concerns, uh, you know, especially in a post-COVID context when feminist sectors, uh, like feminized sectors, sorry, like health and education have taken such a hit. There's a really practical and pragmatic concern amongst employers and unions about what else can be done to enable the long-term participation of women in work. Uh, and, you know, again, Jess will speak to this, but there is an opportunity here to address uh, sort of inadequate existing leave and policy frameworks. And that is what is driving union engagement with this space. You know, the idea, again, that someone should have to claim sick leave or personal leave uh, for a reproductive health concern when they have the same amount of leave uh, as say a cis man of a workplace, that is um, a matter of controversy in the legal policy space. Uh, and then finally, in terms of the direction of where um, we're going, so, sort of something encouraging that we've seen is that there's um, a real uh, conscious effort amongst employers to make sure that these policies are not designed as sort of a one size fits all approach. As Mary said, they have done at the Victorian Women's Trust, there's this real um, emphasis on making sure that these policies are adaptable to individual needs and circumstances. And that's really important from our perspective and from uh, in the work we've done, we've argued that that helps to de-essentialize these processes. It helps to um, make it clear that not all people will experience them in the same way. And it's, you know, just having the policy supports available doesn't mean that everyone will want or use them. Um, 
you know, so those are sort of the unifying themes in this policy area. But in terms of future policy pathways and where we think everything is headed, uh, like I said, there's no one uh, approach that unions are taking. We're sort of seeing engagement at varying levels. Uh, at one in, you know, one of the most popular approaches is for employers to just introduce these policies at a management level, which gives them quite a bit of flexibility to adjust, you know, the leave entitlement, um, maybe increase or decrease it. You know, this is the human resources approach. These policies may or may not be codified in enterprise agreements, but this is sort of, um, you know, a really popular approach that's been taken in Australia and the UK. Uh, then, of course, we are seeing the rise of these policies on bargaining agendas. This is the industrial relations approach and making sure that these entitlements are codified into enterprise agreements, which just makes it that much harder for management to uh, adjust or change those policies down the track. Uh, and then finally, and what I would argue is most interesting, is the um, really influential role of trade unions in advocating for legislative and industry reform in this space. We're seeing that these uh, issues really don't just stop at the bargaining table. There's a real desire and drive to um, codify these issues at the highest level, which in terms of scope of coverage of employees, you know, law reform is where the most significant change would happen. So, you know, uh, I'm not sure if any one of these approaches has emerged as the most obvious one yet, but we think that all three will play an important role going forward. Um, okay, and then in terms of my views on the implications of these policies, um, I think for, in terms of the trade union movement, I don't think it's possible to understate the significance of these policy developments. Uh, you know. Uh, historically, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, the union movement has been subjected to significant feminist criticism for its male-oriented nature and for its failure in the past to give voice to the interests of women at work. Uh, of course, this has changed in recent decades. Trade unions have played a really important role in advocating for issues like flex work, uh, parental leave, domestic violence leave, uh, which are all really important developments. But I think this is, you know, the emphasis on reproductive policies, I would argue, is sort of a new era in union gender-based advocacy that presents, uh, you know, again, its own unique challenges um, and questions. Uh, as Liz said, there's really important concerns about the immediate and long-term impact on women and gender equality at work, particularly managerial and employer attitudes towards women. Uh, and again, there just was, there isn't really one obvious best practice approach here. You know, it's really an open question at this stage. So, you know, in terms of policy design and development, uh, reproductive leave policies are quite unique in that policy development and implementation is really rapidly outpacing empirical evaluation, which is sort of the inverse of what we saw with maternity and parental leave. So there are significant knowledge gaps here. Of course, we have really encouraging anecdotal evidence that these policies are having the intended effect. Uh, but we sort of need to monitor them more closely going forward to make sure that they are sort of performing at their optimal level. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, as Liz already discussed, we need to be um, really mindful of the risks and opportunities in this space. You know, there has been significant pushback against the idea of reproductive policies, uh, particularly among feminists who are concerned that they could, uh, you know, reinforce notions of biological determinism, the idea that uh, women's economic opportunities should be naturally predetermined and limited by their biology. Obviously, that is a really regressive notion that nobody in this policy space wants to see play out, but that is one of the, you know, the common themes and the pushback in the media that we see about this. So hence the need for evaluation and to make sure that uh, the data lines up with the policy's intention. Uh, okay, I'll wrap up there by just saying that you know, I think unions are sort of a space to watch and they've been the pace setter and I wouldn't be surprised if they sort of uh, set the agenda going forward. Uh, but it's still an open question as to how workplace policy will uh, best perform in these areas. And we need to, again, uh, engage quite carefully with the risks and opportunities in the space. Um, I, you know, also uh, in terms of the most promising policy pathway, where we'll get the best results, 
That is also an open question. But again, in, our, in my research with Liz and Marion, we've hypothesized that all three uh, approaches, bargaining, law reform, uh, and employer initiatives will play a really important role. Um, and yeah, I think there really is an important uh, opportunity here in the sense that these policies could have the intended progressive effects. They could normalize and destigmatize the body at work. They could challenge existing policy structures that have alienated women uh, and transgender and uh, non-binary people who have experienced these issues in silence. So, you know, this is a really important issue that I think isn't going anywhere. And yeah, it's one to take quite seriously. So. Uh, I'll just conclude there by saying thanks so much for having me and more than happy to answer any questions. This is from Margaret, who, who says, this subject is huge for women. Does this seminar approach the fact that this subject could be used as ammunition to continue the pattern of inequality uh, and to reinforce pay rate differences between women and men? Uh, Thanks for that question, Margaret. That's one of the most fundamental concerns here, absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the difference between the intended effect and the impact is one that we are really concerned with and that is the most important area of policy evaluation. Uh, when these policies have been debated in places like Italy um, and I believe also Spain, one of the primary concerns was that these policies will actually end up being a hiring disincentive uh, due to uh, employers perceiving female labor as more expensive than male labor. Uh, this is a really tricky topic that speaks to the issue of not just um, equal pay, but also negative uh, gender stereotypes and attitudes towards women. And as Liz said, these were similar concerns to those raised when uh, sort of maternity leave and parental leave were new concepts. I don't know if I have a clear answer to your question, apart from the fact that um, this is sort of one of the most critical uh, issues that will come up in policy design and that will need to be evaluated because if it becomes clear that employers are harboring negative attitudes toward women due to these policies, that will obviously be something that needs to be addressed um, uh, either through education or through anti-discrimination uh, law. So yeah, that's what I'd say to that. Thank Thanks, you. Margaret. <laughs>